tonight calling it off following assurances by the ministerial subcommittee to address their woes railway trade unions end strike action lowering the bar cabinet of ministers brings down the minimum qualification required for medical education fighting war crimes former eastern province governor mohan vijay vikrama questions as to why the government failed to use lord naysby's statement on alleged war crimes why is the government of sri lanka accepted these type of allegations without opposing it religion for reconciliation prime minister ranil wickremesinghe says sri lanka should set an example to the world on religious harmony and in international headlines a surprise for trump Alabama votes after 25 years to send a Democrat to the U.S. Senate in a direct blow to President Trump. We know who we are, Alabama. A warm welcome to all our viewers across Sri Lanka and around the world. This is First at Nine and I'm Mahesh Johnny. Tonight we begin with a statement from the Head of State on National Security. President Maitripala Sirisena says the government will provide all necessary facilities to equip Sri Lanka's security forces with knowledge as well as expertise when implementing state policy on national security. The head of state made the pledge at a ceremony held at the Sapugaskanda Defence Service Command and Staff College today. The graduation ceremony of Sapugaskanda Defence Service Command and Staff College was held under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena. When fulfilling our responsibilities and duties towards this peaceful country, we should get the best practices from countries which are ahead of us when it comes to national security, international relations and regional security, as well as knowledge needed for international and regional security and technology. We should obtain the necessary training from those advanced countries. Through that, we should be committed to fulfill obligations towards national security, social welfare and responsibilities for the development of the country. Submissions of nominations for elections in the 93 local government bodies continued for a third consecutive day today. The window for nomination submissions will close at noon tomorrow. All main political parties as well as independent political groups were seen making their submissions during the day today. The UMP submitted nominations for several local government bodies in the Badula district under the patronage of Minister Harin Fernando. We start off our usual loud election process once the O-level exams are over. I would like to say to those who were concerned with me getting a ministry that I will continue to work for any ministry I get in the future. Meanwhile, the UMP also submitted nominations for Akmi Manapradesh Sabha in the Gaur district under the patronage of parliamentarian Vijay Palihetya Rachi. JVP submitted nominations for Gal Neva Pradesh Sabha in the Anuradhapura district under the patronage of former parliamentarian Vasanta Samara Singha. UMP also submitted nominations for the Paliagud Urban Council under the patronage of Minister Sarath Monseka today. That's not what he meant. What he wanted to explain was that in the past, elections were won using all sorts of influence and that isn't happening anymore. Meanwhile, it was under the patronage of Deputy Minister Harshali Silva that UMP submitted nominations for the Kote Municipal Council. Kote will win. I am worried that other parties won't have anything if we win all the 21 local government bodies. I completely disagree with what he said because that sort of politics don't happen anymore. I will let him know my thoughts when I meet him next time. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka Podujana Perumana submitted nominations for the Kubiagane Pradesh Sabha in the Kurunagle district under the patronage of parliamentarian Johnston Fernando. <laughs> There's nothing much to think about what he has to say because his mind doesn't work well. Meanwhile, JVP submitted nominations for five local government bodies in the Kalutara district today. UPFA in the meantime submitted nominations for several local government bodies in the Kegol district. 
UMP also submitted nominations for the Hambantota and Surya Vava Pradeshya Sabhas under the patronage of Minister Sajid Premadasa. Meanwhile, former mayor of the Talavakale Lindula Urban Council, Ashoka Sepala, has decided to contest in the upcoming election independently following, following political pressure from a joint opposition parliamentarian, C.B. Ratnayaka. Former mayor also revealed a video to the media which shows parliamentarian Ratnayaka verbally abusing him. <laughs> Meanwhile, a group of unidentified individuals has set ablaze two motorbikes that were kept in the house of a supporter of Pudujana Perumuna in Madhigiriya last night. The motorbike owners alleged that former UMP MP Samantha Pereira, who represented the Madhigiriya Pradesh Sabha, is behind the incident. However, the parliamentarian denied the allegations. Well, questions on members defecting and other possible crossovers was what former President Mahindra Rajapaksa was confronted last, uh, last evening by journalists. They were put to him uh, following a religious function in Anuradhapura. <laughs> Such an issue has only arisen in Ampara. It is an issue that has been there for some time. Although they leave, the voters won't. As far as I know, there is no such thing. They could either go or come. Did the General Secretary inform me before leaving? They can leave like that. If they are coming from the government, they should come with an agreement. There is. They spoke to us. They will come at any moment. In other local stories we have for you tonight, the Cabinet of Ministers agreed to change the minimum qualifications required for medical education. It is now prescribed as two credit passes and one simple pass in the GCE advanced level examination in one sitting for the subjects chemistry, physics and biology. This was revealed during the Cabinet media briefing held in Colombo today. The Cabinet of Ministers approved to extend the present agreement between GVK Embry Lanka Private Limited and the Ministry of Health, Nutrition and Indigenous Medicine for the continuation of the service of 1990 Suicide Ambulance Service. It is expected the service would extend to other seven provinces. Meanwhile, approval was also granted to pay compensation for 110 landowners of the vulnerable area surrounding the Mithotomula waste dump as marked by the National Building Research Organization. Compensation to be paid will be equivalent to the assessed value of the properties. In the meantime, a number of other current issues were also discussed at the Cabinet media briefing today. The President wants to save the party more than joining with them. Those who intend to break up the party will do it somehow. What I understand is there is no party called Sri Lanka Bodhijana Peramuna. In our electorates, people vote for the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. I don't think there will be a party called Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna after elections. The discussions are now over. We held the last discussion and they were unsuccessful. Dilan Pereira said he pleaded as much as he could, yet I did not do that. They sabotaged it. GLP Riz said in public that there is no time left and the work is done. The president said that he would do anything to bring the party together. Our 
Our police is independent now and there is a police commission. The police always work according to the law. We accept Tel Aviv as the capital. There won't be any change to it. We won't change our embassy. I think even Europe opposes it. When it comes to considering Jerusalem as the capital, America is isolated. Trade unions of the railway services decided to end their seven-day-long strike today following discussions with the ministerial subcommittee appointed to look into the issue. Speaking to media today, the chair of the subcommittee, Minister of Special Assignments, Dr. Sarath Amrugam, said that the ministerial committee was successful in coming to a common consensus with trade unions, which includes recognizing the railway services as a closed service. A four-member ministerial committee led by Minister Dr. Sara Tamanugama was appointed by the President yesterday to look into issues faced by railway trade unions. Other members of the subcommittee include Minister Akleviraj Karivasam, Dr. Rajda Sena Ratna and Ranjit Madhuma Bandara. After two-hour discussion with relevant parties held at the Minister of Special Assignments in Batramula this morning, the strike was called off. Our committee will recommend to Cabinet that railway, health and education become closed services with their own scales and own rules and regulations. The issue was regarding recruitment as assistance to the engine drivers. So we have said that till this matter is discussed fully with the relevant trade unions, that action to recruit to this category be held in abeyance, only to be temporarily suspended. The trade union representatives raised various administrative issues regarding salaries, card uh, promotions, etc. So the committee decided to meet next week and spend a lot of time with the officials so that we could go into the individual grievances and see how we could settle that. We agreed that no striker or trade union should be penalized for having participated in this strike. Accordingly, the trade unions, all who are represented here and representing all those who were involved in the strike, agreed to call off the strike with immediate effect. Despite discussions, however, several trade unions voiced their concerns. This very committee assisted the government in halting the enrolment of assistance for locomotive drivers. We would like to ask the government and the Cabinet of Ministers whether this is the change they wish to provide. We requested the government to call all relevant parties before the 23rd and revert the decision, failing which we will take legal action. Meanwhile, railway employees who participated in the strike were officially notified of the conclusion of the strike action. The topic of the strike also came up at the Cabinet Media Briefing today. It is difficult to create 32 salary structures for a large-scale state service such as this, consisting of 1.5 million employees. We will be presenting a Cabinet paper to make railway services a closed service by next Tuesday, and we will meet with the railway unions the day after in order to solve 75% of their remaining issues. In other local stories we have for you tonight, Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe emphasizes the need to protect the unity and harmony between different ethnic and religious groups in the country. The Premier expressed these views while addressing an event where the certificate of Sri Lanka received for the Guinness World Record for the world's tallest Christmas tree was presented. Minister of Petroleum Resources Development Arjuna Ranatunga presented the certificate for Guinness World Record to Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe today for the world's tallest Christmas tree which was built at the Golf Face Green last year. Ten years ago there was a major army camp where this Christmas tree was erected. There was a war between our own people but now the location is a symbol of peace. Although this is a predominantly Sinhala Buddhist country, there is freedom for anyone from another religion or ethnic group to live in harmony. We should set an example to the rest of the world by engaging with one another. We should protect the unity we share. <laughs> Thank you.
Retired Rear Admiral Mohan Vijay Vikrama says that the government should have used Lord Naseby's statement to defend Sri Lanka at the UN Human Rights Council's Universal Periodic Review Working Group held in Geneva, Switzerland recently. Speaking at the House of Lords in UK recently, Lord Naseby questioned the death toll of Tamil civilians who were allegedly to have been killed during the conflict. Speaking at a media briefing held today, the former governor of the Eastern Province said that the statement presented by Lord Naseby at the House of Lords recently urged UK to take up Sri Lanka's issue with the United Nations Human Rights Council. Lord Naseby also called for amendments to the resolution on the basis that 40,000 Tamil civilians hadn't been killed in the Vanya offensive and of the 7,000 to 8,000 killed, one-fourth were TTE cadres. Lord Naseby, during uh, his speech at the House of Lords, he categorically said his information that Sri Lankan government has not targeted civilians. Sri Lankan government has only fought the uh, terrorists. And he said during the human, uh, humanitarian operations, what he had studied, he said that the government took extra precautions in saving civilian lives. They fought with zero casualties in mind. And to blame security forces who have acted so responsibly is a crime, he said. And at the same time, he told the British government must influence, use its influence and withdraw all charges which have been made against Sri Lanka at the Human Rights Council. Now, if you take that point number one, where 40,000 people had been massacred, how can an army which went and rescued 300,000 civilians kept as a human shield and an army who rehabilitated 12,000 LTTS who surrendered can commit killing 40,000 people during the same period? Is there any logic behind this? At the same time, have these numbers had been collaborated with names and addresses of those people? Have they found mass graves? And why is the government of Sri Lanka accepted these type of allegations without opposing it? Petroleum Trade Union Alliance has alleged that the Lanka Indian Oil Company have imported a stock of substandard fuel to the country. This was revealed at a media briefing held in Colombo today. Once again, the Lanka Indian Oil Company has brought a stock of jet fuel which is substandard. After the first test was conducted, it was confirmed that the fuel was in fact substandard. But the fuel jet A1 was not imported methodically by the IOC. They have not followed the tender process, but political influence was used to import the consignment. Various individuals have created stories pertaining to this matter. We have brought the jet fuel that is in compliance with standards. Those are false rumours. Minister of Social Empowerment, Welfare and Kandyan Heritage, S.B. Desanayaka, says that though the headcount poverty index has declined to 6.7% in 2016, it remains a major social issue to human development. He made this remark at an event held in Colombo today. The National Conference on Social Work for Poverty Reduction and Sustainable Development, organized by the National Institute of Social Development, was held under the theme Social Work for Poverty Reduction and Sustainable Development. The event was held under the auspices of Minister of Social Empowerment, Welfare and Canadian Heritage, S.B. Disanayaka. As to my own conviction, human poverty is uh, more than an income-related issue. From the human development perspective, it is the denial of choices and opportunities for living a tolerable life. Though our headcount poverty index has declined to a level of 6.7% in 2016, poverty is still a major social issue which hinders human development. Therefore, eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimension is a challenge and necessary requirement for sustainable development. Watching Sri Lanka's award winning news channel, Other Verena 24 7.
Let's move on to business news now. Rapidly diversifying Sri Lanka-based conglomerate Jet Holdings is planning to list on the Stock Exchange of Singapore by 2019. Emphasizing that the current economic environment in Sri Lanka is not conducive to business, Managing Director of Jet Holdings says that his company hopes to venture into more international markets through product diversification. The National Platinum Award winner at the Sri Lankan Entrepreneur of the Year Awards spoke exclusively to other Derrida today. The managing director of the Jat Holdings, Elian Gunawardhan, received the National Platinum Award in the Extra Large category at the 22nd Annual Sri Lankan Entrepreneur of the Year Awards held on Monday. Speaking to Adit Darana, Gunawardhan touched on the current economic climate in the country while highlighting the performances of local companies. Jat has, has grown at about 30% a year. Even during the war, we've had some fantastic years. But this year, I understand that most companies are performing at about 50% of their projected budget. Jet has, has been fortunate that we have made a lot of extra effort. We've been able to actually achieve that by doing a lot of diversification. But the economic environment today in Sri Lanka hasn't been extremely conducive. As far as the budget itself is concerned, one of the industries that we are in is in the apartment building projects from the 1st of April. These apartments will have a 15% wet a customer would have to pay. And I think that will take an, an average 30 million apartment, again, increase the value by about four and a half million. And that might be a bit prohibitive to the new customer. Elian Gunawardhan went on to speak about the future plans of the holding. I started JET 24 years ago as one person to bring it to what it is today. We contribute over a billion rupees in taxation to the government. It has given us great pride. We are in Bangladesh, we are in Maldives, we are in Pakistan, we are in India today. So we are in all these subcontinent countries. Even though we are a private company, we run it with an independent board of directors with excellent corporate governance. So we are ready to go public anytime. I mean, we could have gone public five years ago. But unfortunately, due to the uncertainties of the Sri Lankan, you know, stock market, we obviously have decided internally not to go public in Sri Lanka. If we do go public, we would most probably go public in, in Singapore in 2019. Let's take you to the stock market now. Sri Lankan shares fell to their lowest close in nearly eight months today as investors sold banking and diversified shares. The all share price index lost 7.59 to close at 6,352.77, its lowest close since April 17th. The index lost 0.6% last week in its fifth consecutive weekly drop, but it's still up 2% so far this year. Daily market turnover improved to about 680 million rupees, with the highest contribution from John Keel's holdings. Now, here is Imesh Fernando from the Colombo Stock Exchange with more details from the trading flow. The market capitalization at the end of the day was 2,896.43 billion rupees. Today's foreign purchases were 400.4 million rupees and foreign sales were 464.34 million rupees. There were six crossings today and the crossing turnover was 319.48 million rupees. Let's move on to international news now. In a stunning conclusion to a contest that received international uh, attention, Democratic Doug Jones is the apparent winner over Republican uh, Roy Moore in Senate race in the U.S. state of Alabama. It took an extraordinary alignment of events, including a sex scandal involving teenagers, for Alabamians to elect their first Democrat in the Senate in 25 years, but they triggered a political earthquake that will be felt far and wide. With 99% of the votes in, Jones was leading 50 to 48%, a margin of more than 20,000 votes. However, Moore refused to concede Tuesday night, telling supporters in Montgomery, Alabama, that he may pursue a recount. The apparent outcome was another stinging defeat for President Donald Trump, who bucked his party's congressional leadership to stage a last-minute rescue mission for Moore. Meanwhile, winner of the race, Doug Jones, thanked voters, calling it a victory for decency. 
We know who we are. This is an election to tell the world who we are and what we stand for. Well, a top UN official yesterday urged the Security Council to visit Myanmar and demand an end to attacks on civilians, saying heartbreaking and horrific accounts of sexual atrocities by Myanmar soldiers against Rohingya Muslim women are witnessed in the country. Pamela Patton, a special envoy of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on sexual violence in conflict, said that one woman told her that she was held and raped by Myanmar troops. One survivor described being held in captivity by members of the Myanmar Armed Forces, the Tatmadaw, for 45 days, during which time she was reportedly raped over and over again. One woman showed me how she can no longer see out of her left eye, which was bitten by a soldier during a vicious sexual assault. A Security Council resolution demanding an immediate end to violations against the civilian population in Rakhine State and measures to hold the perpetrators accountable would send an important signal. Myanmar and Bangladesh signed an agreement on voluntary repatriation on the 23rd of November. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, however, was circumspect of the timing of a possible return of refugees. Before they can return, Burmese authorities must create an environment that is safe for people to return voluntarily to their homes. It is more than just a process. There must be a cultural change, which only Burmese leadership can do. While we are hearing promises from the government of Burma, we need to see action. Also in international news, U.S. Senator Kristen Gilliband got at President Donald Trump yesterday for attacking her on Twitter for calling for an investigation into accusations of sexual harassment and misconduct against him. Six U.S. senators, including Gilliband, says Trump should resign. Trump lambasted Gillibrand on Twitter yesterday, writing, quote, Lightweight Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, a total flunky for Chuck Schumer, and someone who would come to my office begging for campaign contributions not so long ago, is now in the ring fighting against Trump, unquote. Schumer is the Senate Democratic leader. Gillibrand, whose name has been floated as a possible Democratic presidential candidate in 2020, said she would not back down. It was a sexist smear attempting to silence my voice. And I will not be silenced on this issue. And neither will the millions of women who have been marching since the Women's March. You are watching Sri Lanka's trusted news brand, Other Therana 24-7. On to sports now, following a splendid victory in the first one day international against India, Sri Lanka today slumped to a 141 run loss in the second one day international. Put into bat, India were rampant and piled on 392 runs for the loss of only four wickets. Opener and captain Rohit Sharma played an outstanding innings of an unbeaten 208. In their chase, Sri Lanka could only muster 251 for the loss of eight wickets. A silver lining for the visitors was the unbeaten 111 played by former captain Angelo Matthews. The series is now tied at 1-1 one -one with, one, with one match remaining. Lanka out of it. He doesn't want to lose his wicket. Suranga Lakmal, that's for sure. And that's the end of it. That's the uh, India by 141 runs. Well, Australia are leaning towards bringing in bowling all-rounder Mitchell Marsh for the third Ashes Test, but will not name their team until the toss tomorrow morning. Steve Smith's side is two nil up in the first five match series and could reclaim the coveted urn with victory in Perth. Michelle Marsh would, uh, could slot in at number six in the order below brother Sean. Mitchell Marsh, who had shoulder reconstruction earlier this year, would provide medium face to back up to frontline quicks Mitchell Stark, Josh Hazelwood and Pat Cummins. It's purely for the reasons we think we need an extra bowler on this wicket and you know, the, the stats sort of suggest over the last couple of years that the, the bowlers have had a pretty heavy workload out in this, on this wicket. So, you know, we're, we're probably leaning down that way at the moment. But um, again, it'll, it'll 
depend on what we think the wicket's like tomorrow and if it is going to be hard and fast and bouncy, that, that might again change our thinking. You are watching Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. Well, Catherine and Chang is at the other there with us in with your forecast first evening edition. Good evening and welcome to Forecast First. Now, temperatures are to vary between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius over the course of the next 24 hours. Now, you can see that a low pressure zone is in development, particularly in the start off in the central hills in the noon time, gradually spread towards the east and then to the south of the island. This could bring about some thunder showers in Batiklo and Mena areas, and most of the northern region can experience some wet weather. Now, moving downwards, you can see that there will be some thunder showers in the Colombo and Gaul areas as well as in the central hills of Kandy over the next 24 hours. That is it from your weather centre tonight. Let's now take a quick look at your city by city forecast. And that is a part of your world tonight right here on Other Derana 24-7. I'm Mahesh Johnny. First at 9, we'll return tomorrow at the same time with Indi Bariyamohatta. Be sure to join her then. When you have the time, make sure you connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash first at night or on Twitter at twitter.com first at night. Now, before we wrap things up for today, we would like to take you to the National Research Medicinal Plant Garden in Haldumulla. The garden is home to over 2,000 medicinal plants that is used as remedies for many an ailment since historical times. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night. and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, other than 24-7.